Well, a very good Sunday morning to you. I'm so glad that you're joining us for Church Online. I'm thrilled that you're part of our community of faith. And I would like you to know that you don't just have to watch the screen. There's actually ways you can interact. You can uh, announce yourself when you come on in the comment section. You can welcome others when they do. Uh, it's a great way for us to make some connection. Uh, I also just wanted to take a moment. I know that as we're getting close to school restarting, uh, this is a really challenging time for a lot of parents right now. And uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about how this is going to work and how it's going to work out. There's a lot of complexity to child care and split strategies. And, and uh, even our children can experience some anxiety as they're getting ready to go back. I would just encourage you, you know, access the resources of heaven through prayer. Even when there's nobody in the room but you, you can ask God to help provide confidence and, and clear direction for your family and for your children. And then when you see your children uh, struggling, just take a moment. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. It doesn't have to be an eloquent prayer. But just invite God to help in the situation. It's amazing how effective that can be. And so I would just encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, so how do we sanctify our home? First, the place where we worship, our church home, and then the place where we live, our family home. And what we've learned is that there's some ways. Through the weeks, we've, we've been talking about this. One is to invite the presence of God into our home, whether it's worship or where we live, through worship. Like we actually welcome him through worship. We also talked about how we can seek God's agenda. We all kind of have a... a an agenda of our own, uh, the things that we hope happen. But God actually wants better things for our lives than we do. Uh, so to learn to surrender our attempt to control things and to yield control to him helps to sanctify a space. Uh, we talked about how that in the midst of a struggle, God can become very real. And that when you're struggling, you can bring those struggles to God and you can share those struggles with others. And that becomes a sacred space because God does some amazing work there. And then last week, Pastor Jonathan talked about uh, the, the, the process of forgiveness, that we can actually uh, receive forgiveness from God. We can learn to forgive ourselves. We can learn to forgive others. Because wherever unforgiveness exists, uh, it actually uh, contaminates an environment very strongly. And so we can have an environment that is sanctified and forgiveness is a huge part of that process. So the question is, so we all know that we need sacred space. How can we access the sacred space available to us? And is there any way that we can expand sacred space so that others can access it too? That's what I'd like to talk about today. So how do we sanctify our home? We're gonna talk about the strategy. I'm going to be reading out of Psalm 73, and this is actually quite poetic language, so uh, with, with every phrase, I'm just going to give kind of like the, the, the plain uh, explanation, definition of what the psalmist is saying. So he says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. He starts out with the truth that he's learned. He's been taught this, but it's going to be challenged personally for him because he says, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. He, he doesn't have any traction right now. He feels like he's slipping. And in the ancient world, that was a real problem. They had to climb things like mountains. And when you are going up a mountain, if you lose your footing, you can fall and experience injury or even loss of life. Sometimes you had to fight to protect your family or your property, your possessions. And if you didn't have a strong footing in a fight, then that was the difference between victory and defeat. So he's saying, this is an issue that is the difference between victory and defeat and between life and death. That's how strongly he sees this. They have no struggles. Or he says, I, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He uses the word envy which is not just wishing that you had something else. It goes beyond that. It's wishing you were someone else, that you had their life. He said they have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, 
Pride is their necklace. They, they wear pride like ornamental jewelry, and they see humility as a weakness, a character trait of losers. And they clothe themselves with violence. They're willing to exercise whatever force necessary to get what they want. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. Once you allow your heart to become hard, there's absolutely no end to the selfish creativity you can, you can come up with to get what it is that you want. They scoff and speak with malice. Everything is funny to them, and their intention is to take advantage of others. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. If you don't give them what they want, they will make your life miserable. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of earth. They accept no authority over themselves. They boldly vocalize their intentions. No one is above me and this is what I'm going to do. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is telling us that people who live like this attract a lot of attention, they exercise a lot of influence, and people who observe them start asking questions like, does God pay attention to anything that's going on in anyone's life? This is what the wicked are like. Always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. They're not careful in what they grab, and they just keep grabbing more. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long, I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. He's, he comes to this conclusion. It seems like trying to do the right thing has been a waste of my time and my life. And, and the word that they use here for affliction and punishments it's, it's the kind of pain that comes when you feel constrained, when, when you've been tied down and you can't get away. And what he's saying is, the rules that I've been living by are causing me pain, and I'm missing out on the life I wish I had. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. So now he's telling us that this wasn't something he was saying out loud. This was the internal struggle that he was processing. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. See, outside of the sanctuary of God, you can have an opinion about God. But in the sanctuary, you have an encounter with God. And that's not even close to the same thing. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Uh, the world they're living in is not actually a real world. It's just a world that feels good. And that's not the same thing either. When my heart was grieved, and my spirit embittered. I was senseless and arrogant, ignorant. I was like a brute beast before you. Envy and bitterness have this capacity to numb us up and dumb us down. He says, it's like I became just an ox, that the only time it goes is when you poke it with a stick, and the only way it goes is when you lean it or move it with the yoke that you control. The ox has no strategy. It's just its strength is being used for the benefit of someone else. Yet, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward, you will take me into glory. God is always present. God is always holding you. God is always guiding you. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. He says, you are all I want in heaven, and you are all I want on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. There's more to me than my physical body and the heart that pumps the blood within it. Those 
who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. What he's saying is the further we get from God, the more we disintegrate in life. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. See, without sacred spaces, we just tend to lose our way. We become disoriented. Um, we don't seem to have a homing instinct for God. In fact, the Bible says this, like sheep, we're all prone to wander and to go astray. Without a sacred space, we will only see what we want. There's a lot of things that, that we will close our eyes to and be unaware of. Our culture constantly wants us to want even more. We've got a whole system of commercials built on this. And please understand, they don't just want you to want more stuff. They want you to want someone else's life. They don't just show you a product that you can purchase. They show you someone else's life. And don't you want their life instead of yours? And when we accept that, something happens inside of us. We begin to devalue our own life. And we come to a conclusion. And the conclusion is that God isn't fair. Not just that God isn't fair, but that God doesn't care. And he doesn't just care about me. He doesn't care about anything. And once we cross that bridge, there's a temptation we will face. And the temptation we will face is to throw away the values and the character traits that limit how we live that act as the, as the direction, the compass for how we navigate our lives. Our first temptation is not usually to do something evil. Our first temptation is to see God as uncaring and our choices as unimportant. God doesn't care and what I do doesn't matter. And as soon as we cross that bridge, we're capable of almost anything. We come to conclusions that there's no advantage to living a righteous life. This is what this psalmist was struggling with. This is what he talked about. But there's an underlying motivation to this. As soon as the words were formed in his mind, he began to understand there was something else going on beneath this. And what he was discovering is he was saying this, there's no advantage for me to living godly. It doesn't benefit me in any way. There's no advantage for me to tell the truth. There's no advantage for me to give to the poor. There's no advantage for me to, to keep my promises. This is what he's saying. If it doesn't benefit me, then it's a waste. This is what he says. It's all in vain. If we feel like it's a waste, then we actually believe that God and others are here to serve us rather than we are here to serve them. This is a huge distinction. This is something we should think a lot about. Do I only tell the truth when it suits me? Do I only keep my promise when it benefits me? Do I only give to the poor when I get proper recognition for it? And the psalmist, as soon as he realized this is the underlying motive, it startles him. And he heads to the sanctuary. You see, envy doesn't reveal anything to us about God. Envy does reveal something to us about ourselves. That's what we notice now. Envy hides God from us, but it reveals what's going on in us. Envy doesn't change anything in us. It just reveals what's already there. So in a sacred space, we see our potential, not just our desires. This is important. You begin to see your life quite differently with a longer view, with a wider view, with a deeper view. Uh, and, and this is important because if all you do is focus on the things you envy, what you discover is that their, their shelf life is on the short side. For example, maybe you, you envy beauty. Well, maybe you are a beautiful person, but eventually that beauty will fade. Maybe you envy resources. Those resources can be run out or taken away. The, your, you might envy strength. Your strength can fail. You can envy influence. Your influence will eventually wane. And the thing is, if those things are your life, when you lose those things, you feel like you've lost your life. But if you live with eternal values, something else begins to happen. What you begin to experience is that when you lose those things, it's just a cosmetic loss. It's not you. It's just something you had. 
If you live for lesser things, the psalmist put it like this. He said, it's like living in a dream world. It's like sleepwalking. I'm not fully awake to who I am or to what the world really is or how it really works. And what I want you to know is we will be awakened from that sleep. We can be awakened by loss. Or we can be awakened by God. And the psalmist begins to realize that the sanctuary, the sacred space, the place that God has sanctified for his purpose, that's the place to wake up. So we need these sacred spaces. In sacred spaces, we begin to realize that God is always present. This is fascinating. He's always near us. He, he isn't just here when things are good. He's here always. He's not afraid of painful things or awkward things or embarrassing things or complicated things or scary things. He is always present with us. He doesn't run away. He doesn't keep his distance. He's with us in the midst of all of it. And in sacred spaces, we begin to realize that God is always holding us. Now, this isn't some kind of absent-mindedness, dragging something around you, forgotten that you're even carrying it. And it isn't the kind of thing where you're holding something out, dangling it over something that could be dangerous. When God holds you, it's with a grip of grace. God will not let you go. You see, this is what's true. We need to remember this. God already let go of everything so that he could have us. Jesus, who had all the resources and riches and authority of heaven gave it all up and took on the form of a servant so that he could bring redemption and life and grace and truth to us. He let go of all of it. And, and so that means that God isn't distracted. When we're going through challenges and we're facing hurdles and, and, and sometimes we veer off course, God is not distracted by any of that. He will not let us go. He keeps us in the grip of grace. And then in sacred spaces, we begin to realize that God is always guiding us. This is important because we haven't arrived yet. We're not at our final destination. We still have a lot of steps to take, and that means that we need counsel, and we need wisdom, and we need discernment, and we need insight, and we need promptings, and the Holy Spirit comes into our lives to help us with that journey. Jesus put it like this in his prayer. He said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us away from the temptation. The temptation, remember, is the internal struggle. And the first temptation is to think less of God and less of ourselves. Lead us away from the things that would cause us to think like that. And then deliver us from evil because there are things that lay claim to us. They bring bondage in our lives and they torment us in ways. And so God wants us to understand He's available. He's always guiding us. He wants to lead us away from the things that will cause us to fall into temptation. And he wants to deliver us from the things that have already laid claim to us. Now, you and I, we can't really sanctify a space. My presence in a room doesn't really change that much. But we can invite God to sanctify it. What I'm wondering today is if you're willing to acknowledge something, and this is going to get really personal, really fast. It would be really easy to ignore what I'm going to say next. Just to shut down the feed, the stream, and not think about this. But just like this psalm must come to realize that there was an internal struggle. Do you have an internal struggle going on? Are you frustrated with God right now because of what he hasn't given you or because it seems like he has given that to someone else and not you? And there's this little thing of envy starting to build. Do you feel like if you are doing things the right way that you are wasting your time and limiting your life? If you feel that way, what I can tell you is you need a sacred space. You're not going to fix this just by an act of your will or making a single decision. You need an encounter with God. 
And maybe right now where you are, if you're willing to receive, if you're willing to accept, God's willing to create a sacred space right where you are and, and waken you to his reality and his truth and his grace and his power. So I would like you just to, to bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. And I'd even ask you to do this, just kind of hold your hand out. And I want you to think of the things that, that you tend to envy or the people that you tend to envy. And what I want you to do is to release them to God. Let's pray. Uh, Father, but the simple truth is uh, we do get frustrated. There are people who seem to have no constraints in their lives, and it seems like they have no consequences for that. And we find ourselves not just wanting what they have, we want to be them. And the only thing that's going to wake us up is a sacred space, a place that you have sanctified for your purpose, a place where we can encounter you. So would you help us today? We take those things and we let go of them. We do not want to live for lesser things. We want to find out who you have created us to be and what you are helping us become. In Jesus' name, amen.